All right, it looks like people are finishing logging in here. Can you all hear me? Give me a wave. Great. For those of you who are still logging into the Zoom, please be sure to keep your microphone on mute the entire time. And we will get started. So good evening and welcome to the CDEM residency match in the era of COVID advice for medical educators and emergency medicine webinar. My name is Nicole Dubash. I am a CDEM executive committee member and president elect. For those of you joining for the first time, CDEM is a national organization that serves as the voice for undergraduate medical education and emergency medicine. The core purpose is to be the voice of UME for those in our community and our students. CDEM's core organizational values are to provide educational resources, collaboration, and membership. This will be a moderated webinar geared for faculty in emergency medicine who advise students on the residency application process and the match. While students are certainly welcome to listen in, the questions are going to be geared for our peers as faculty. So you are more than welcome to listen, but just be aware that these questions are for medical educators. During this presentation and during the question and answer session, you're gonna hear from three leaders in medical education across the country. So I wanna take a minute here to introduce our presenters. First, we have Dr. Fiona Gallahu. Uh, Dr. Gallahu is an associate professor and the program director at the University of Washington, and she is currently the president of CORD. Next, we have Fiona Jung. She is an associate professor and director of medical student education at Johns Hopkins University, and she is the current CDEM president. And finally, we have Dr. Colin Hegarty. Dr. Hegarty is an associate professor at Regents Hospital and the program director at their institution and has been very involved in the slow and oh slow process. So as we all know, COVID has created an unprecedented situation for medical students across the country applying to residencies in emergency medicine. With the new consensus recommendation and restrictions on away rotations, interviews, changes in the clinical experiences for our students due to the pandemic, a lot has changed. There's a lot of uncertainty right now and a lot of questions for both our students and for us in, in medical education. So the purpose of this webinar is to provide an overview on the consensus statement in applying to the 2020 EM match with recommendations from best practices on how to most effectively advise our own medical students in various situations. And again, one of the things I want to emphasize is that there's a lot of unknowns right now. Our students are very anxious. We are very anxious. And I think if we kind of go into this with the general goal of advocating for each other, advocating for our students in the general applicant pool, things should work out and we should be okay. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gallahu, who's gonna talk a bit about the consensus statement and some of the implications. Dr. Gallahu. Hi, my name is Fiona Gallagher. I'm the president of the of CORD, which is the Council of Residency Directors in Emergency Medicine. Um, we created the consensus document, which I believe uh, most everybody has probably seen. Uh, and actually, uh, Dr. Young and Dr. Hughes uh, were the primary authors of it with uh, us. Um, and it came out of you know the council, uh, the coalition of physician accountability had just come out saying all interviews should be virtual this year. And that was leading to a lot of consternation. And certainly we were um, especially concerned about students coming from orphan schools where they were not gonna be able to get a, a rotation since we knew that there was gonna be limitations on that. Given our concerns about the COPA um, recommendations and the limitation on a lot of, at a, a number of sites for visiting students, we came up with this consensus document. And the consensus document in uh, essence, uh, first of all, is designed for non-military students. Uh, military students are required to do two away rotations. So that's one of the first things to think about. The second thing is it was designed to be guidelines. They're not, um, partly because we, we know that in the 
anytime when things are a little bit anxiety provoking and there's, uh, as Dr. Dubash mentioned, there's a lot of anxiety around how do, how do we get the number of slows we usually get? How do we get our students um, in front of folks? How do we get program directors to recognize these limitations? How do we, as program directors, uh, try to make sure that the playing field is fair. So this consensus document was attempting to create guidelines to address those issues. And in essence, the consensus guidelines say that um, all EM resident candidates should do one slow rotation. And there's different slows. And uh, you have Dr. Hegarty, who is our slow master. Um, so if you have any questions about slows, he's, he is often the right person to communicate with. But there's a gold standard slow, which is your EM rotation at a residency training site. And when we said that there is one slow rotation, the intention is at your gold standard slow rotation, all students should be able to get one slow rotation and the expectation should be one. Very much considering the fact that we had these orphan programs who are str gonna struggle to get one. The second consensus guideline statement is that all EM applicants should be considered to have one slow. So they should have one gold standard slow. Um, and that was to, again, limit the anxiety that students might feel about, uh, usually you get two gold standard slows and this year the expectation is one. Uh, and then the third thing is basically to um, ask program directors to think about the other letters, the other types of information in the packets. So, um, Think about the other types of slows. Um, for example, there's an O slow this year that the slow committee, which Dr. Hegarty uh, co-chaired, um, trying to think about uh, rotations, getting an O slow from a rotation that is a non-EM person who has had a lot of opportunity to identify your clinical strengths and, and highlight those other pieces of the application. And then the fourth thing that we said was, again, just to reinforce COPA's suggestions and, and well, guidelines and rules is that all uh, all interviews will be virtual this year and that includes even for your home students in order again to be thinking about fairness and equity it's different experience to interview somebody in person and we wanted to make sure that all interviews are virtual this year and then we also made a recommendation on how many interviews we based on the literature that's existing out there uh, we know that the most average students uh, should be able to get should be able to match 99.9 .9 students will percent of students will match if they have 12 interviews so we wanted to make sure that we place some guidelines on the number of interviews people should have and only in very unusual situations so the people with red flags such as a failed uh, core rotation or a failed step score or other red flags uh, should have maybe up to 17 or a couples match who might have some additional challenges but the average student should have 12 interviews and not more than that. So that again, we're thinking about equity. So that was the consensus document in, in summary and hopefully that, that explains the guidelines. We do know that there is a lot of variability between different schools. Some schools have two rotations that are mandatory. That was not intended to address those um, situations. And all we ask is that those types of schools are transparent in their in the guidelines of those slows that that is how things are so I'm going to turn it over um, but that is the consensus document in a in a nutshell thank you dr. Galhio next we're going to have dr. Hegarty talk about some of the common questions that are coming up specifically regarding the slows the different type of slows as well as interviews so this is more of the nuts and bolts of how we're actually going to implement some of these changes during the during the pandemic dr. Hegarty uh, well first of all thank you for having me on it's uh, certainly getting to that time of the year where it's very timely to be going through all of these things we're going to cover today just because I think as advisors to students that are going into emergency medicine this is the time to be connecting with them on many of these topics to make sure that we're really setting setting them up for success in the upcoming months so this is awesome to have this now so thanks to cdem sam for putting this on and uh thanks for having me on so, um applications and letters this is definitely one of my favorite things to talk about so i'll get going on the questions that we have here and then at the end we'll see if people have other questions 
I can help out with as well. The first question that's here on the common question slide is how many programs to list on ERAS? And before I give you a, a specific number, or a general guideline, the one thing I wanted to tell people out there for especially the EM advisors to talk to their students about is that I'm a big believer in get this number right in the beginning and apply on time. And this year on time means October 21st is your deadline. So students should have all their programs in on that day. They don't wanna wait in weeks into it, add more programs on when they're not hearing back from enough, enough um, programs inviting them for interviews because that is not a recipe for success in any year. And especially in this year with the timeline for everything being ultra compressed. So the first thing I wanted to make sure to tell everybody is just get all the numbers right and do it right by October 21st this year, because that's the first key to success, I think. The second thing is I think our role as EM advisors is critical in this because we are the best ones to tell students, are you kind of in that normal average group where we can say, um, if you want to get 10 interviews that you actually go on, which means you might have to uh, get 12 to 14 interview offers to schedule them on 10 different interview days, maybe you need to apply to 30 some programs. So like a three to one ratio of applications to number of interviews you're gonna accept. Um, that's true for most students, but we all know those students who might have an occasional red flag in their, fold, in their file. Um, they're more familiar with their board scores, their EM performance other you know, great qualities that they have with research leadership, things like that. And we can probably give them the best number to flex from maybe that baseline number. So really, if you think of a top student, maybe 20 to 30 programs is really a lot to apply to. An average student is gonna be around 30 in the 30s. And then you're gonna go up from there. That's a good kind of mindset to have for advisors. I know at my medical school, the University of Minnesota last year, the average number of applications was up in the 50s, which is just way too high. So somehow these students are thinking that applying to more places is going to be the recipe for success. And what they'll find out uh, in any year is that it's really just the interviews and doing well in the interviews, which is going to be the key part of it. So as advisors, I think we can help a lot with the number of programs and to kind of give good advice on that. Um, one theme that I tell to my students, and I think for everybody here listening tonight in terms of a EM advisor recommendation is, I will actually tell students, I don't mind if you round up a little bit and apply to a couple extra programs because you're, you're not sure how competitive you are out of your geographic region, let's say. But the key is you don't want to interview at too many programs because that's not helpful to yourself and it's not helpful to the system, which is the other students applying to the programs to everybody. So really, if you think of how many interviews you should accept for your average US medical student, somewhere between 10 to 12, as Dr. Gallagher already pointed out, we know from years worth of data that 98, 99% of students will match in emergency medicine if you have that many interviews. So it doesn't do you any good to interview at more programs than that because all that it's going to do is take your time and energy and focus away from the interviews you actually want to perform your best on. So I think that's going to hold true this year, just like it would in any year because in-person interviews to have the energy and to get ready to roll for those days, that takes a certain number of amount of energy, but these zoom or virtual type interviews, it's going to be the same concept. So even though you're not going to be sitting in the room with the program director, with the APDs, with the chief resident or residents, you're going to be interacting with them and the students need to have energy and enthusiasm and have read information about the program. And if you're going to interview at too many programs, you're not going to have that ability. So I think as advisors for us to really counsel those students on look at the consensus guidelines and let's go with that. For most students, 10 to 12 interviews is perfect. And if your couple's matching or potentially if you have some hiccups in the application where maybe we'd say, you know, that step one score is low enough, you might have to apply to more, interview at a few more. You had a year one or two preclinical course that didn't go well. Same thing, you could maybe flex up a little bit from there, but in general, 10 to 12, I think is the right number because the data supports it and I think energy-wise, it's realistic. Uh, recommended or enforced, you know, this year I think there's going to be some attempts to see if there's any kind of coordination we can do around interview season to help with this. 
But at this point, I would just tell students, this is at least a recommendation and stay tuned if it's gonna be more than that, if anything changes over these next couple of months. Letters of recommendation. So this is that's good timing as well to talk about because a lot of students will be going through this hopefully over these next couple of months, getting ready for applications to start in October. Um, most years, people would get, let's say two to even three EM slows, uh, the E slow from a residency rotation and then get maybe one or two um, additional letters. This is not most years. So with the, most students only being able to do one EM rotation at a residency site, the norm and what we're shooting for is for actually most students to now have one ESLO. So think of it that one ESLO is actually now the gold standard for 2020, 2021, which means it's important for students to think about the other letters that they're gonna get. If they had the luxury of doing a subspecialty rotation, ultrasound, EMS, pediatric emergency medicine, something like that, that would be a great rotation to get another slow from. You can get a subspecialty slow from that rotation. If your medical school happened to have another EM rotation you could take, but it's not a residency site, so stay here from a school, you don't have your own residency, but you can take emergency medicine at your school, you can get a slow from that rotation. And that's totally fine. That's different than the ESLO you're going to get from your residency rotation that you do as a student. And then the OSLO is really the new one for this year where the concept behind it is emergency medicine, when we're reading applications, so I'll kind of flip for a second and go into my program director role. When we are reading through applications, narrative letters of recommendation are fairly unhelpful. And most non-EM rotations will write students narrative letters of recommendation. It's almost like a Word document. They can just change the student's name, change pronouns, update the year, and it's just the same letter over and over again. And we find them to be fairly unhelpful. So knowing that this year we were going to have to rely more on those letters, we wanted to create something that was going to be more useful to help students with applications, to help programs with reviewing um, data and reviewing applicants. So the OSLO is essentially that. It's a way to have letter writers from non-emergency medicine rotations use a format that's more familiar to the letter readers in emergency medicine to have it make more sense to us. What rotation is a great one to get uh, an OSLO from? It's really any rotation that you feel like you either did a good job in or um, the people got to know you. That's more important than which rotation it is or how, uh, what title the letter writer might have. So internal medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OBGYN, psychiatry, neurology, family medicine, all good options if it's something that you clinically had a good performance or they could evaluate you clinically. Those would be great um, opportunities to get an OSLO. So I'd say for this year, the norm is actually going to be one ESLO, maybe one SLO from either subspecialty or a non-EM residency rotation, and then the rest will be OSLOs. And that's going to be kind of the norm for students for this year. So in terms of advising them, I'd kind of have that, those numbers in your mind to kind of help students and guide them. And then uh, virtual interviews, I'll just tell, uh, talk a little bit about this. And um, Jessica Smith on the CORD listserv recently, she's the program director out at Brown, did an awesome job of kind of um, reaching out to emergency medicine programs and getting a sense of what are virtual interviews going to be like at those programs and is the timing going to be different? Will the numbers be different? And here's some of the information that she learned just in the past week. Invitations will go out fairly quickly. So if you picture uh, October 21st, you apply. In those first two weeks, a lot of programs are going to try to get through applications and start getting interviews out there. So the offers will come probably faster this year than in other years. Most programs won't start interviewing until November. They'll go through January with maybe a few going into early February. Potentially for students at their home institutions, they might start virtual interviews at the end of October. 51% uh, of programs said they're going to interview slightly more applicants than typical. 39% said they do about the same number. So it should be about the same to maybe a little bit more than usual for most programs. And then how will the virtual interviews in that process be different than what we're used to? 
I think a lot of the format will actually be similar with the exception of just, it's gonna be Zoom or virtual uh, more than in person. But uh, a lot of them said in terms of doing overviews, the number of interviews, interacting with residents, it would be fairly similar. The one difference or a few differences would be maybe more panel interviews this year than historically I've seen in emergency medicine. The dinners or the night out the night before to meet and interact with the residents will obviously be virtual this year. And there potentially would be some kind of food gift cards that might uh, be sent to the applicants to have lunch uh, when they're interacting with residents, say, on the interview day. Uh, from a recommendation how to advise the students, I know there was just a, a session on this in the past couple of weeks that EMRA was participating in and others. And essentially, I'd give the recommendations to students, preparation is critical and being professional during your, your interview is gonna be critical. So um, those are probably the biggest things in terms of the format of the virtual interviews and tips that we'd have for um, students going into emergency medicine. So I'll pause there, because I know we have more that we're gonna cover. And then at the end, we have some questions we'll get to that will go off of some of the information I just covered. Thank you, Colin. And now we have uh, Dr. John Gunt, who's going to talk about some specific recommendations for the students and how we can help them and how we can relieve some of their anxiety. Dr. John? So before I go on with that, I did have one question for Colin. Um, is there ever a time when you would want to ask for a narrative letter? Is there ever a time when a slow form might not be appropriate? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the biggest thing to think about when we're, we're advising students is any of the slow forms, e-slow, subspecialty slows, even the o-slow are designed to be for clinical experiences because so many of the questions on there ask things about their clinical performance. So I would say for students that do um, research and have a heavy interest in research and worked with a research advisor, that's probably one instance where a narrative letter is going to reflect that experience better than a slow can, because a slow is not going to ask the right questions for that. And then you do get some students that um, for this year are doing these virtual type rotations where they don't have any clinical um, performance at all. And I think a narrative letter might reflect that better than again, the slow might, where it's asking questions about clinical performance that we're not going to be able to assess. So those would at least be two of the instances I can think of. I know towards the end, we might get into some questions about different students we're advising and say international students would be a big um, group and this year, international students, I'm guessing, are going to have a harder time than normal getting clinical rotations in a US hospital. And so getting a slow for an international student is almost going to be impossible if they didn't do a, a clinical um, rotation, but they might have done some work in research or observed or done a virtual rotation. And that's probably a chance to do a narrative letter. So I do think that this will be the year that there are some narrative letters that will tell the story better. And I think that would be my answer to those are the type of experiences I can picture would be better from a narrative letter than from a slow. Thank you. So to get back to Nicole's question about what can our students do to sort of shine in this process, I mean, this is something that I think, you know, you guys as longtime clerkship directors and advisors are, are probably pretty familiar with, but there's a couple of COVID specific considerations. So, you know, one is just, um, you know, first and foremost, getting them into any um, emergency medicine relevant uh, clerkships or elective experiences that we possibly can without, of course, violating the rules of the consensus statement. So we're not telling our students that they should go out and seek um, second and third and fourth gold standard emergency medicine rotations at residency sites, but maybe they would like to do, maybe you have a community um, affiliate in your hospital system and they'd be able to do some emergency medicine time there with one or two um, interested mentors who would get to know them really well and be able to write them really strong letters. That would be a great opportunity for what Colin was talking about, the non-residency slow, um, which 
you know, if they have uh, preceptors who know them really well and can comment on in detail on their clinical acumen, that's going to be a really helpful um, rotation for them. Similarly, any places that are still offering subspecialty rotations in ultrasound, toxicology, trauma, wilderness medicine, all the other kinds of stuff, uh, peds emergency medicine definitely is a big one, all the other kinds of stuff that sort of um, is part of our specialty, but again, wouldn't be covered by that one gold standard flagship EM rotation. Those are other great opportunities to get slows, to get face time with emergency medicine faculty and residents to get recommendations um, by you know people who um, are really going to be able to comment in a meaningful way about their emergency medicine potential and to get additional perspectives and, and advising as well beyond what we can um, can provide as their primary advisors it's also really wise for students to be strategic in scheduling their home electives so you know a lot of most of the med schools are back in session now to one extent or another and students want to use any time that they have available um, to do rotations where they're going to have real meaningful clinical contact with patients and where they're going to be um, learning skills and assessed performing skills that are relevant to emergency medicine so higher acuity rotations things like ICU, trauma surgery, um, subspecialty services that are really relevant to emergency medicine like orthopedics or sports medicine, ophthalmology, you know, those are great opportunities for students to, to get in the mix, to see a lot of patients, and to get really meaningful OSLOs. Um, in the same kinds, I mean, it won't be in an emergency department, it'll be, like, it'll be in some of the same kinds of high acuity situations that they would be working in in the emergency department, seeing some of the same kinds of patients, solving some of the same kinds of clinical problems. Um, so that's another really good use of their time right now. You know, as far as other like non-rotation type of stuff, um, this is the year to really, really help students go through their CVs and their personal statements with a fine tooth comb, help them buff up all of their achievements and make sure that they really pop for program directors and that the PDs can see how meaningful the things that our students have done really are. Um, and one of the cool things about the pandemic is a lot of students jumped in and did amazing stuff during their downtime. Like all the students had that quarter where they were just off unexpectedly and some of them just hung out, but a lot of them did really amazing things. You know, we had students who developed entire online electives for their peers, you know, and highlighting those kinds of achievements and the ways that students can, could contribute um, to the healthcare and educational effort during the pandemic is a really cool opportunity. So I encourage every advisor ask what your students did during their time off and if they did something cool that they didn't think to bother telling you about be sure to highlight it um, or get them to highlight it in their ARIS application and in their CV. So those are some of the things. Oh, the last thing just to mention um, is, of course, get students to get out there and get some face time with programs that they're interested in. All the programs this year, I can't say all, but a lot of programs this year are going to be really looking to put themselves out there electronically to set up sort of meet and greet opportunities or virtual classes or inviting students to come to their conferences or whatever. There's lots of ways that programs are going to be trying to help students get to know them better and get a feel for what they have to offer. So tell students to take advantage of those opportunities. And if they're not seeing it on the website, if they're not able to find, you know, find out through normal research, tell them to reach out to the program coordinator and ask, hey, I'm really interested in your program. Are there any opportunities where I can join the, the Zoom call for conference? Are there any opportunities where you're having, you know, social online social gatherings with the residents? Make sure that they take advantage of those things because the more they do, I mean, one, it's going to be good for them because they're going to be able to make more informed decisions about the culture of the program and making sure that they're finding a place with a good match, but it's also going to give the program face time with them and it's going to show interest and initiative, which are things that, of course, programs value. So that's most of what I have to say about enhancing the application. Um, as far as advocating for students in need, you know, I think that students in need fall into two categories and I want to be really clear about this. One category are our own students, right? Our students who are at risk. Now, let me emphasize, every single solitary student we advise thinks that they are at risk and they are not. 
So the vast majority of students are not AOA. Just statistically speaking, they're not in the top quartile of their class because guess what? 75% of them are in one of the bottom three quartiles. So they're not all above average. They're not all AOA. They don't all have 265s on their boards. They haven't all founded international NGOs or been presidents of startup companies, right? Like they're normal medical students and they're fine. They're perfectly fine. Those are the students who can go to 10 to 12 interviews and will definitely match. Those are the students that we're not worried about. Students who we are worried about are those like Fiona and Colin mentioned who have failed, especially failed a clinical rotation, that's a big one, failed a step of the board exam, that's a big one, or um, experienced uh, disciplinary action at their medical school um, or had some kind of involuntary separation from their medical curriculum. So those are the kinds of students we do want to be concerned about. And I encourage you, um, when you talk to your students, one, ask. Um, I, early on in my advising career, had made the very foolish mistake of not asking my students about that. They were all like these amazing people. It didn't occur to me they might have skeletons in their closet. Well, I had a student who failed two preclinical courses. Turned out he failed two preclinical -pre courses when his mom was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer and subsequently went very quickly from being healthy to in hospice to the end of her life. And he tried to slug it out through med school, which in retrospect was a terrible idea. This is obviously completely understandable. It's completely fine. It's easy to explain, but I didn't have the sense to ask him about it. So I didn't help him explain it. Right. And then his top choice school calls me and is like, what about that epidemiology failure? What happened there? I was like, woo. So you want to make sure that you know what's going on with your students so that when people do reach out to you, because you know, we all talk to each other, you have good answers. Right. Um, and then help them develop a strategy for presenting their best self. So, okay, this thing happened. It was bad. What did you do differently as a result of it? How did you recover from that and change your trajectory? What evidence of success after that do you have to show that this doesn't reflect who you are? Those are the kinds of things that we can help them put out there to um, advocate for themselves. The other group of students in need are those who are not our students. Right? Those are the students who are at orphan uh, programs who largely are not advised or represented or advocated for by people on this call because we're mostly faculty at residency programs. So that might not be strictly true and huge props to anyone who doesn't fit that category, who chose to come and um, wants to help out your students. You are amazing. And I know a lot of you are doing amazing work. But for those of us who are at residency affiliated institutions, we can advocate with our administration to provide rotation experiences for orphan students. We can't all take in a bajillion students from all over the country. It's not safe. It's not going to be allowed by our institutions. I know this. But we can stand up for those in need and say, hey, that med school right down the street that doesn't have a residency affiliation where their students are scrambling desperately to get rotations, could we take five of them? Could we just take five? We have enough space in our curriculum. Can we do that? And you'll be amazed. Your institution, if you make a good case for it, and you explain that this could be a make or break um, for uh, for the applicants who are in that boat, they might, you know, really be willing to work with you. And that's certainly been my experience at my own institution. So I just want to encourage all of you to try to help advocate for fairness and advocate for opportunities, even for those students who aren't our own. Great. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. So with that, many of you submitted questions when you registered for this webinar, which have been excellent. Um, we have gone through them. There have been a lot of common themes that have come up. So we're going to go through now and answer those, um, the most common questions that we didn't cover in the webinar. And then if there's extra time, if you want to submit additional questions on the group, the group chat function, uh, we can, some of us can respond there and we can bring them to the whole group for discussion if we have some time at the end. So first question, this one has come up many, many times. The, there's the concern about the one ESLO limit. My students can complete more than one at my institution and I don't want them to get penalized. So this is a very common question. Um, I think it's important to note that the consensus recommendations were meant as a guideline and they were meant to make sure that students weren't penalized for not having more than one EM clerkship because that's simply not feasible right now. 
there are a handful of schools that have multiple EM residencies affiliated with them and therefore those count as different EM rotations, even though they're under the same umbrella medical school. There have been a lot of discussions within each school, within um, email listservs with those institutions about what the best way to, to, to handle this is. What is gonna be equitable for everyone? What's gonna be the best representation of that student's performance, et cetera, especially in, in light of these guidelines. Um, I think right now, these institutions are doing various, um, various things with their slows. Some are doing, as you can see from the group, discussion here are getting together and doing writing one eSlow for an eight week experience that may cross different residency programs. Others have decided, you know what, we're going to do our own slow for that four weeks, even if our students are going to be doing multiple ones at our school, and we're going to just explain that in the letter that this represents their home institution. I think the important thing for us as educators is to make sure that our students are following the consensus and only doing one with the purpose of not taking away an opportunity from another student. Now, there are some schools that have multiple EM residencies associated with them, multiple spots, and the medical school has prohibited any visiting students to rotate. Thus, they're left with an excess of EM rotations. And the question comes up, do we deny our own students from doing those open rotations or not? And I think a lot of schools, a lot of these schools are allowing that. Um, I think when it comes to writing the letter or letters, I think the most important thing for us as letter writers is to state in that explanation part of the narrative that this, this is what we decided to do as a group. This is the student's home rotation. They may have multiple of these. We were not allowed to have other students rotate. Therefore, they had the opportunity to do this, and this is why we are writing them this letter. By doing that, you're explaining the rationale. You're also making sure that the student is not getting penalized. Now, some institutions have decided we're just going to do one based on the consensus, and it's going to encompass all eight weeks or, or whatever they ended up doing. And I think explaining that as well is another option. All right, so another question that's come up a few times, how should students demonstrate interest in a program geographically distant from where they are or where they went to medical school or where they grew up? So I'm gonna let Colin answer that one. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question for any year, but this year, especially with the away rotations being really impossible and just not happening, it's gonna be even probably more important because picture a student from like a Midwestern medical school who's interested in going to one of the coasts in a normal year, they could do an away rotation there. And now all of a sudden when they're applying to schools, uh, to residencies in that part of the country, they'll see a slow from a program in that area. It will make sense to them that they have, they have an interest. This year, they're not gonna have that opportunity. So I think the students have a couple of options of what they can do. The, the easiest and something that I think a lot of students don't know is even an option is to personalize your personal statement. So students put a lot of effort into the personal statement. And I would tell you that as a program director, there's a varied amount of interest programs have in diving into those personal statements to make big decisions about applications. A lot of times it's just a nice supplement to get to know some of before you interview them and you get to chat with them in person. But this year, I think people will be looking into those personal statements a lot more. And one thing that students can do is they can do either personal statements and save a copy and have it be for certain regions of the country or for individual programs. So you can really have a personal statement be per program. You can save it and call it University of Washington. And when you send it to Fiona and she opens it up, it will tell you all about why you're interested in a PGY one through four program in Seattle, Washington, and here's specifically why. And that might be more helpful to that program to read that this year than any other year. So that's one thing I think students can do is personalize the personal statement. The other thing that you can do in this, uh, there might be some program directors that might get mad at me for suggesting this, but I think you can always email programs as well. 
and give them a little bit of a background about here's why you're specifically interested in that program. We all get so many applications and as a student, it's almost easy to get buried in the pile of hundreds and hundreds of applications. And if you're not from that part of the country and you want to kind of say something to that program about like, hey, listen, here's why I'm actually interested in your program, your city, your training environment. Don't be afraid to send an email to program leadership and express that. And I think this year more than any other year is a good chance to do that. Now we might get a lot of correspondence that way and that's on our end, then we have to kind of sift through it. But I think for students, those are two good options to kind of put yourself out there in a different way than just relying on the application, hitting the button and then keeping your fingers crossed that you're gonna get a interview, especially if it's something that's geographically far away from your institution. And I know I'm sure for others out there that advise students, we see those students that are very much, um, what, what do we see on their application? It strangely shows like where they're born, where they went to undergrad, where they've worked, where they went to medical school, where they've done rotations. And you get some students that just every single thing on their application is all in one location, but yet they're truly interested in going somewhere else for residency. And I think to express it this year on the personal statement or to reach out to programs would be a, a powerful way to catch the attention of those programs differently than just relying on your application to stand out on its own. And I would add to that, like, just be authentic, right? I mean, like, that's, you know, it, those are, those are important things for programs to know, but be authentic, right? I mean, that's, that's a, that, that goes a long way. And I think that type of authenticity that we're talking about goes, you know, it, it, it shines through the application. Great. So the next question, and this one's actually pretty active right now in the chat, what if my student is from an orphan program and cannot get an EM rotation in East Low, or what if they get it after the October 21st um, deadline? So Jules, I don't know if you wanna just kind of summarize what's been discussed on that and some, some ideas to help these, these students. Yeah, so certainly for those students um, who are able to get a rotation, but it's gonna be late, they are in a much better position than the students who can't get a rotation. Um, I, I think it's, I don't want to speak for the program directors, but I think that everybody understands that this is a pretty weird year and that while everybody's doing their best to, you know, get things in and get back on track and back on cycle, um, the real bottom line is that different schools have different situations as far as when they're allowing students to travel and not and when they let their students come back in and what rotations they have to finish before they can do a ways. And there's a lot of variables. So I think one, program directors are probably going to be a little bit more flexible this year in general um, with timing than they would have in past years because there's going to be a lot of students who have variable timing that's not their fault. Um, you know, I think one thing that could be really helpful is if you have, if a student is at an orphan school, but they're able to do an EM rotation and you're going to be writing them like a non ESLO EM letter. Um, if you indicate on there, and that was an idea generated by one of the clerkship directors from an orphan program, Aaron, um, who's like, hey, I can just put a note on the, um, on the slow that I'm going to write for her saying she's going to this other rotation and that is going to be completed on, you know, whatever, October 25th um, and to look out for that letter so that there's like at least a little bit of a, um, of a uh, notification to the program director. Other things, the student can themselves reach out to programs and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm really interested, but my application, um, my slow is going to be a little bit late because my rotation doesn't end until slightly after the deadline. Can you please keep, take a look out for it? Or you, those students can have advisors advocate for them as well um, and have their, um, their EM uh, you know, the person who manages their EM rotation at their school or um, a different advisor reach out on their behalf to top choice programs and tell them what the situation is. But my hope is that program directors will across the board be flexible and understanding because I think students are definitely in a little bit of a tough position this year with things yeah. being pushed back. And I, I don't think we can say that anymore. I think this is the uh, situations like this are where we can really advocate for our students 
it's there's so much unknown this year. It's a unique situation, but the students are going to be really looking for us, whether it's a different geographic area or getting their letter a bit late given their unique circumstance. So, all right, next question. This has come up a couple times. How are we regulating the number of interviews and the number of e-slows? And how do we prevent top students from hoarding 20 to 30 plus interviews this year? So I'm gonna let Fiona take this one. Yeah, I, this is a really important, I mean, first of all, we're hoping that people look at the consensus document and just act like citizens of our specialty. Uh, you know, I think first and foremost, articulating expectations is probably the first step um, to, to making that happen. We are certainly looking at other opportunities to try to limit interviews um, and, and with any luck, we'll be able to sort of roll out some, some ideas. But I think more importantly is, is really reinforcing the students that they are part of the emergency medicine community. And really, you know, we know, um, it, it, you know, we, we do find these things out. I mean, one thing that we have been able to do as far as you, three years ago, we found out that students were triple booking and then canceling two interviews at the last minute. An interview broker now is able to flag that to us. So there are mechanisms that are going to be in place for us to get flagged or to limit um, some of these. So I, I would hope that students on the front end start, you know, just, just act like citizens and recognize that their behavior affects other people. But um, there, there may very well be some some opportunities for us to to, to really cap this um, in a in a more legal manner, um, in the sense of just 100% capping. But uh, more to come. I also think that we as advisors can um, emphasize that point to students. Um, students don't always fully understand the implications of their actions in this regard. Like. I, I mean, not that they're incapable of understanding, but they just don't always think it through. And they're like, yay, I'm doing good. I got a bunch of interview offers. This is wonderful. And they're not thinking about the fact that every interview offer they're holding is an interview offer that's taken away from somebody else. And every program they interview at that they're not really considering going to is undermining somebody else's opportunity to go to that program. You know, so like a lot of times I don't think students are doing it out of malice, they just aren't thinking through the fact that inter residency interviews are a limited resource like everything else. And their programs aren't going to just interview more people because they have more interview offers. They are actually taking a resource away from somebody else, much like the student I'm reading about in the chat right now doing 6 EM uh, rotations is taking rotation spots away from somebody else. And that is wrong. And I hope that nobody matches this person because that's a terrible thing to do this year. These are limited resources that need to be shared equitably among applicants. Great. So another question has come up. How do we connect students with a remote advisor if they have no home EM program and no advising at their institution? Jules, I was hoping you could answer that one. I can't completely answer it, but I'm going to, um, you know, just like Fiona said, there were some unknowns about how we're going to cap uh, residency interviews. I think there's still some unknowns in exactly what this is going to look like. But um, I spent the, um, a few weeks in July reaching out to the Dean of Students at every single orphan school in the country. I actually ended up meeting many people on this call and, and many people who are advocates for EM at orphan schools because they ended up uh, circulating my, my letters to you guys. So that was a really cool outcome. Um, but basically we wanted to know how many students do you have going into EM and do they need help? Um, because if they do, you know, we want to get a sense of what the demand is and try to match that demand with supply. Meanwhile, on the other side, I've been working with, um, uh, with Doug Franzen, who has been really interested in doing this from the Ask EM side um, to try to recruit advisors, ideally locally, right? So we would like to see, you know, if there's a med school with a residency program in Kansas down the street from a med school that doesn't have a program, um, you know, in the same town, we would like to see those get together and uh, be able to uh, 
you know, take advantage of advising at the local level. If that doesn't work out because that school in Kansas has 25 people going into emergency medicine and that one poor advisor um, can't handle that extra volume, we can certainly help try to spread things out a little bit and make it equitable and manageable for everybody. But our hope was to pair school by school um, so that schools in need could be paired with schools who have a, um, advising resources at a residency program and are really actively involved with the residency selection process and able to, um, to speak to these issues. Um, so we're working on setting this up as a formal program. It's still a little bit of a work in progress. For all of you on the call, please, 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 when we put out a um, request for advisors, please consider signing up. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of your time. You can take just one student if you want, but your half hour that you spend talking to that person might make or break their application experience this year. So I really hope that you'll consider doing that. Um, for students who have really tough situations and like really need somebody to talk to, um, I'm also personally willing to be contacted and I will talk to that person myself or find them somebody that they can talk to um, that would meet their needs. Um, please don't send me everybody who's anxious, but if it's somebody who's really in a tough situation, I've been doing this for almost 20 years and, and I'm happy to help them out because I just, I really feel for the students this year. I don't want any of them to be in a situation where they're flying blind. Great, thanks, Jules. Another question that's come up is, um, and touched on it a little bit in the, the talk here, but uh, what are the pros and cons of virtual rotations? So a lot of institutions, mine included, are starting these virtual clerkships, which are you know largely Zoom or video interface sessions with advising, clinical lectures, exposure to resident didactics, um, et cetera, ranging from anywhere from one week to full four weeks. Um, some of them are called clerkships, some of them are called virtual experiences. As you all probably seen from the CDEM and the core listservs, there's a lot of these out there now. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is new. We don't really know how this is going to play a role. I think on the one hand, it is a way for programs to reach out to students who would otherwise have done an away rotation or would have come for an in-person interview. It's a way for, for students to get a sense of a program um, and to, to interact with some of the faculty and the residents because ultimately we want our students to be at the program that is the best fit for them. So I think from that respect, these experiences are great. Um, you know, some of the questions that have come up additionally are, you know, what are the drawbacks? Is this going to be an expectation to match at the program? Are they going to get a letter from it? I think, you know, nowhere in the consensus does it say that students need to do this virtual experience. I think it's, it's purely for the students to be able to gain that exposure and for the programs, depending on how things are set up, to potentially interact with applicants outside the interview day. Um, by no means should students feel the need to sign up for like, you know, five virtual clerkships at all. I think, you know, getting the clinical exposure as, as Jewel was saying at their home institution and other areas and other rotations is gonna be far more valuable to their training. Um, in terms of letters, I think it's important to note if you do run one of these virtual clerkships or if your, your institution does, they should not be getting a slow from this. The slow is designed to be for a clinical experience. So, and I, I personally haven't heard of any pro of these programs offering letters. If they do, it should be a narrative since it's not an actual clinical experience. Um, but I think, I think we have kind of yet to see at this point where, where things go with that. But again, good opportunity for, for students to get exposure to the program by no means required to match at their top program or one of their top programs. And then your final question that we haven't really touched on, this was brought up in, in the, the questions you all submitted. What about advice for international medical graduates who cannot complete an EM rotation? Um, There's another one that came up about, you know, other unique circumstances like students who had taken time off or are switching specialties and cannot actually get that rotation at this time. Um, in terms of the international medical graduates, I think, you know, the, the scope of this webinar is for, for US MD and DO students. Um, you know, every year we have international students apply to EM. What I can say about this is statistically speaking, if you look at the number of applicants over the past few years in EM, and if you look at the number of spots available, there isn't huge variability from year to year. So 
you think about it, you're going to have approximately, give or take, the same number of people going into EM and the same number of spots, give or take. It will be a bit more challenging if they're not able to get that EM rotation. I would recommend that advisors, whether abroad or in this country, advocate again for these students and use kind of whatever clinical experiences they have in their letters and, and, and calling programs and advocating for them if that is your situation. Students who have taken a year off and are unable to do an EM rotation, again, I would, I would recommend those along the same lines that us as educators can reach out and, and explain these unique circumstances in letters, contact our colleagues at programs across the country. In some ways, this is even a better year for those applicants than it might have been otherwise because expectations are so much more fluid and we're going to be seeing more variability in what complete application packages look like. So in some ways, this is a little bit of a beacon of hope for those um, applicants who might have really been in a difficult position in other years. And, it, and it's a great opportunity for the Oslos, you know, so if somebody say took a year off after doing some kind of training somewhere else, um, or they're, they're switching programs and often can't get an EM rotation, um, just because they're already, if they're already in a residency training program, a lot of training programs won't allow them to have an EM rotation necessarily. You know, this is the great value of having an Oslo of somebody who's really worked with that student who really, or that candidate who knows that person clinically and has seen them in a lot of tough situations. That is a fantastic, you know, uh, letter, an Oslo would be a perfect letter for them for somebody who really gets to know them well and has seen them clinically navigate the challenges that we work with all the time. And one other thing about the international students specifically, but if you think of any unique group of students looking for advice in this this year and any year, I like the EMRA match program as a way for students to kind of go on and filter and use the data that's there. I know the data is not perfect. I know a lot of programs don't update their data every year, but there are things you can find on there. Say you're an osteopathic candidate and you're looking to match in a program use the data to look at which programs have matched more osteopathic students in the past years. Same thing for international graduates. It's a great way to help them target applications to programs that they might have a better chance of matching at based on the history of programs that have shown a willingness to accept those candidates, oftentimes without clinical letters from EM programs throughout the years. So I think using some sites like the EMRA match where there's some data or going to programs websites and looking at classes, look at the last three or four classes of where they match people from, what schools did they come from? And as a, an advisor, I tell students to do that all the time. You know, Click on programs, look at their last three or four match groups. Um, what schools are they from? And that might give you a good indication of where they're taking people from, especially if you're in a unique circumstance like a, a foreign medical graduate. Great. So it's almost uh, 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. my time out here. So just in conclusion, I first I want to thank all of you for participating in this. The questions you submitted were wonderful and I think pretty helpful for all of us. I want to thank our speakers for offering their insights and expertise. And I want to thank CDEM and SAM for CAT for organizing this as well. Um, I think you know the takeaway here is we're we're all more or less in the same boat. And I say that with a grain of salt because there are those few students who have special circumstances. I think we as educators and as advisors should advocate for our students, take into consideration this unique year and the consensus recommendations that are our guidelines and using that to guide you, I think, I think we're going to be okay this year. So with that, we will conclude. And again, thank you everyone for joining. This was a great discussion.